Hello, my name is Chris Neidl. I'm a volunteer member and co-founder of the Open Air Collective. Open Air is an all-volunteer citizen advocacy network that focuses on accelerating climate restoration and carbon dioxide removal through grassroots member-led policymaking and activism. Open Air volunteers in New York led the research and development of the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act. This is new legislation that has been introduced during the 2022 legislative session in New York by Assemblymember Patricia Fahey and State Senator Michelle Hinchy. Recently, a group of local environmental activists led by former regional EPA Administrator Judith Enk circulated a letter of opposition to the CDRLA that laid out several specific concerns about the bill. We appreciate these concerns, value this group's commitment to serious climate action, and are completely aligned with their principal objective, which is to confront the climate crisis head on with bold, serious, and fully funded policy commitments that can completely decarbonize New York's economy based on science-informed imperatives. However, the letter of opposition includes several fundamental mischaracterizations of the CDRLA legislation, its intentions, and its substance, as well as the subject more generally of carbon removal. In this video, I will respond directly to each of these mischaracterizations with the goal of setting the record straight for both legislators and the general public. I will note that like most legislation, the CDRLA is open to revision and change based on feedback and good ideas from stakeholders. In response to the feedback we have received to date from both advocates and policymakers in New York, Open Air supports some specific and significant changes to the policy, which we hope to see reflected in the bill in the coming weeks. I will refer to these revisions in my comments. And finally, it is very important for us to make clear that no one representing the opposition to this bill, not Judith Enk or any of her fellow opponents, have at any time reached out to anyone at Open Air who was involved in the creation of this policy, in spite of many attempts on our side to have that dialogue over the last several months. Even more problematic is the fact that the opposition will not acknowledge publicly that the bill originated from and is being advocated for by a grassroots climate movement. Instead, Judith Enk and her group have insinuated that the legislation is in some way the product of the fossil fuel industries or corporate interests. Nothing can be further from the truth. And we believe that this is perhaps the most serious and unjustifiable mischaracterization that the opposition has made. To correct this, we invite Judith Enk and her supporters to join us for a public dialogue about carbon removal in this legislation, out in the open in a public forum. We hope that they will accept this invitation in good faith and in the very near future. Thank Before addressing the objections to the bill, it's important that I briefly summarize what the bill actually does call for and to explain why our community at Open Air believes strongly that it has a place within New York State's overall strategy to confront the climate emergency. Most fundamentally, it's important to first make clear what this bill actually concerns, because we believe that the opposition statement suggests that the authors are confused on this most basic matter. The CDRLA is focused on carbon dioxide removal. This describes diverse activities that take carbon out of the atmosphere and durably store it for long periods of time or permanently in geological, terrestrial, ocean reservoirs and products, taking carbon out of the air so it cannot inflict further harm on the climate. Carbon dioxide removal is not the same thing as carbon capture and sequestration, which describes technologies that stop emissions at point sources from entering the atmosphere. But it's important to stress at the outset that the CDRLA is not related to carbon capture and sequestration. What the CDRLA does aim to do is to support carbon dioxide removal through a targeted, transparent, and state-administered procurement program, whereby the state would annually fund the removal of defined volumes of carbon dioxide that have been removed from the atmosphere and durably and securely stored. All projects that participate in this program would be competitively selected and must be located in New York State. The legislation does not select or prescribe specific methods of carbon removal. Rather, it establishes standards that will allow for a multitude of different types of carbon removal pathways and projects to be chosen. These include readily available and cost competitive nature based solutions that integrate with in state natural resources and agricultural practices, but also emerging methods that leverage and enhance ocean and mineral sinks as well as advanced technologies that are purpose-built to absorb carbon from the air, and a growing range of hybrid methods that combine both engineered technologies and natural systems. The program authorized by the legislation has a term of five years, which will allow the state to test, learn, and adapt best practices based on pilot experience. 
After the five-year period, continuation of the program would require legislative reauthorization. During each year of the program term, the state would competitively procure a certain amount of in-state cargo removal each year, starting with 10,000 tons in 2024 and then doubling each year until 2028. Project selection would be multivariable and would select for a variety of solutions each year and across years to help New York establish a diverse set of viable pathways that could be deployed throughout the state based on local resources and objectives. The selection criteria would prioritize projects that are regenerative in nature and would exclude projects that are not supported by local communities. The program's main selection criteria will include three categories, starting with cost. The state will set a maximum per ton amount that it will pay for carbon removal, and proposals that fall farthest beneath this threshold will be given greatest preference. Projects will also be selected based on impact and quality. Projects that deliver the greatest environmental and climate benefits, as well as permanence, will be given preference. And finally, projects that deliver quantifiable and verifiable social and economic co-benefits to the communities in which they are located will be preferred over those that do not. Any proposal that does not meet strict third-party verified do no harm standards that ensure that projects do not impose burdens on local communities will be disqualified from consideration following review by the Department of Environmental Conservation's Deputy Commissioner for Equity and Justice. Also explicitly disqualified in this legislation are any projects that are linked to fossil fuel extraction or which are tied to carbon credit programs that enable polluting industries to offset their emissions. This critical last point is worth repeating. This program will not be funded through carbon credits or polluter offsets. Rather, it will be funded with revenue gained from the repeal of existing tax credits for commercial aviation fuel, which is itself a win for the climate and a non-regressive source that will not economically impact low and moderate income New Yorkers. That completes the summary of the revised proposal for the CDRLA. Now for the question of why. Why should we as New Yorkers want to see this legislation enacted as law? The first and most fundamental justification is because the science is very clear. In order to maintain a livable climate, we must rapidly and entirely eliminate emissions and invest in adaptation and resilience today, as is required by New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act of 2019. But we must also remove excess CO2 that is already in and continues to accumulate in the atmosphere. The UN IPCC made this explicitly clear in its 2018 report, Global Temperature Change of 1.5C, and reaffirmed that fact just this month in its most recent assessment report. But the CDRLA is based on an understanding that these three different needs have different requirements right now. The most immediate imperative and a precondition for effective carbon removal is massive investment in decarbonization and adaptation today and much smaller target investments in carbon removal. And that's what this bill calls for. This is because right now we need to scale up decarbonization solutions like renewable energy, energy storage, and electric mobility and mass transit this decade right now. Carbon removal, on the other hand, is at a different stage in its development and where these decarbonization solutions were decades ago, but it must be ready to scale later in the century. Therefore, the focus for carbon removal right now is not scale up, but more targeted demand support that helps accelerate cost reduction, prove best solutions and establish clear standards so that it can scale deeper into this century. This requires a far smaller investment right now. And we have to start this process right now. As we've learned with our experience with renewable energy and with electric vehicles, maturation of climate solutions takes a lot of time and it can't happen all at once, it takes decades. The IPCC again has been clear that reaching scale capacity for carbon removal by the middle of the century means starting now. Then the next question is why New York? The answer is a familiar one in the US context. States lead in the absence of consistent federal leadership on climate. This has always been the case, was the case for renewable energy, and will be the case for carbon removal. Even as the current administration in Congress in Washington have started to make serious investments in carbon removal, these advances can be just as easily subverted or overturned if and when the Republicans take power. We saw this in 2016 and many times before. 
So states, and particularly states like New York, that have led the nation in climate action are where we should expect leadership on carbon removal to start. And that's what the CDRLA aims to do. Now I'd like to respond to some of the specific points made in the opposition letter. In the show notes, you can find a link to a more detailed document that addresses all of the points. The first point made in the letter asserts that carbon removal is a false solution. Let me be clear, there are bad ways to do carbon removal, and these are being advanced by oil and gas to preserve the status quo and delay action. On this concern, the opposition is correct. But this concern is not an inevitability, and it does not change the fundamental science-based reality that we have to remove carbon on a large scale by the middle of this century. So while there are false narratives and false pretenses, carbon removal is not a false solution. It's a necessary solution that we must do right. The CDRLA, with its safeguards and exclusions, is how you do it right. A follow-on point then claims that carbon removal perpetuates fossil fuel use in ways that will harm environmental justice communities. Again, the CDRLA is not an offset program that is driven or funded by dollars from polluters who are able to pay to continue to pollute. And the selection criteria is rooted in a strict do-no-harm standard and selects for projects that do good, including in environmental justice communities. A third point asserts that it is better to prioritize resources on decarbonization pathways. We absolutely agree, and this is what the bill does. The maximum funding requirement for the proposed revised policy for the CDRLA would be less than $100 million over the five years of the program. That is less than one half of a percent of what it will take to fully fund the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Given that carbon removal is necessary, that it must start now, and that New York is well positioned to lead, this is a very reasonable and responsible investment. The fourth point in the opposition letter argues that the federal government is already investing in carbon removal, and therefore there is no need for states to. As I raised earlier, states have traditionally in the United States led on advancing and helping support climate solutions ahead of the federal government. And given the political realities in our country, while we hope it's not the case, we believe it's misguided to assume that the current policy agenda around climate and CDR specifically put in motion by Democrats will be sustained when Republicans inevitably regain power. We need to drive CDR policy now in climate forward states where policy continuity can be counted on. This was the same for renewables, and it's going to be the same for carbon removal. Another argument made in the opposition letter is that the CDRLA grants tax credits. It does not grant tax credits. It actually does the opposite because it's funded by repealing tax credits for commercial aviation fossil fuels. And the $350 ton number that they reference is not a tax credit, but rather the maximum amount that the state will pay for carbon removal in the first year. The goal of the program is to create demand for early stage carbon removal solutions that are currently expensive, but will become less expensive with scale over time. So the cost cap must be set at a level that actually helps support those solutions today. This is very similar in principle to New York's rebate program for solar, which has been around for many, many years. The rebates used to be very high per system when solar was really expensive, but as the cost of solar came down with scale, those subsidies also came down. CDRLA is a different model, but it's a very similar principle. A consistent assertion by the opposition group in this letter, as well as in other public communications, is that the CDRLA is primarily a support program for one specific carbon removal technology, direct air capture, or DAC. They also characterize DAC in a manner that does not reflect current realities about the technology. And the use case that they provide as an example, not only would not be selected through the CDRLA, it's not even possible in New York State. So let's unpack each of these claims. First, as made clear earlier, the CDRLA is technology neutral and selects based on cost, impact, and co-benefits. This framework is far more likely to select for biochar or agricultural rock dust or a host of other solutions before it selects for DAC. Though cost will come down, DAC is currently very expensive. The average price per ton of CO2 for DAC is currently around $600 per ton and as high as $1,000. As mentioned, the maximum cost cap for the CDRLA program in one year is $350 a ton, and will go down each year. So this will largely rule out most direct air capture during the time of this program. Smaller, modular, and distributed forms of direct air capture may be competitive, but this is very different from what the opposition presents as a concern. They assume that all DAC is large scale and industrial, uses fossil fuel, requires long distance CO2 pipelines, and always necessitates large scale geological storage. 
While large-scale DAC and geological storage ultimately have a big potential role to play in the future, that's not going to happen in New York State during the five-year period of this program this decade. That's because all projects have to be located in New York State, and New York has no real geological storage potential within its borders. And regionally, no pipeline infrastructure really exists to transport it far out of state. And the scale of the projects that the CDRLA would support are nowhere near in size what would justify building a pipeline in any case, which is very expensive. Also, again, DAC doesn't have to be big, and it doesn't have to and most likely will not dominantly run on fossil fuels. DAC can come in modular distributed forms that can be integrated in buildings or at facilities. One promising example that we're excited about at Open Air is using DAC at concrete block production sites where carbon can be pulled directly from the air at the location and injected directly into concrete where it will stay forever. And this application can use waste heat already available at these facilities. So for cost and other technical reasons, these types of DAC applications, very different from what the opposition raises concerns about, are likely to be the kinds that we might expect to see in New York during the next decade, not large industrial sites. And the CDRLA also selects for projects based on their total environmental impact, and therefore fossil fuel powered DAC just won't make the cut. And that concludes my response. I thank you for your time and attention and encourage you to explore this legislation in greater depth and to draw your own conclusions on carbon removal based on an analysis of a broad set of sources. You can find many resources at www.openaircollective.cc slash resources related to the subject. And if you're interested in joining the grassroots effort to make CDRLA law, please complete the join form on our website. And we will be glad to welcome you into our community of volunteers. Thank you.